So, welcome to this uh, second part of the Age of the Universe Controversy Gattocast episode. Less, uh, in the first uh, episode we talked about the... Uh, we did some general remarks on the, uh, the CDM model, so standard cosmology. And then I talked about my work on um, how uh, massive uh, objects, so large galaxies, large galaxy clusters, can be used to understand how structures form in the universe and can be used to understand whether the model that we are using, the, so the mathematical uh, model that we use to describe the evolution and the birth of the universe is, um, is actually a good one. So if we can constrain it or we can find hints of uh, different models maybe being responsible for the observations that we see and, uh, and so on and so forth. So now uh, in this uh, part we'll talk about what happened with the most recent observations of the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, fast forward to today, and uh, we see, uh, this is the kind of uh, articles that I've been reading uh, with these kind of titles. The James Webb Space Telescope prompts a rethink of how galaxies form. And so there were many uh, in the last couple, of, in the last year, more or less, there's been a lot of um, fuss in the press. I mean, a lot <laughs> in, in, insofar the press is talking about cosmology, of course, but um, there's been a lot of talking about how we didn't really understand the age of the universe, which of course is one of the, um, the age of the universe is related to uh, our understanding of the universe. So it's related to Lambda CDM, to the laws that govern the evolution of the universe. So if you challenge the age of the universe, you're, challen the, you're challenging the standard theory of uh, the universe, so you're challenging Lambda CDM. And there's been many, many other um, articles like this. Is the universe twice as old as we thought? Um, and again, this is related uh, to these findings by the James Webb Space Telescope. And there's been all over the place. Uh, the universe is, is much older than scientists previously believe study finds. Now, this is something that drives me crazy when you read some article that uh, is, is not even doubting, is there's not, not, the, not the slightest uh, reference to the fact that this is a study and that might be challenged. It's some preliminary result in a sense that it's, uh, it's not being confirmed by other sources. So we are, again, we are just looking at this, uh, at one thing here, we are looking at galaxies. We are not looking at other possible um, cosmological information so cosmological sources of information like the CMB or I don't know the cosmological power spectrum there's a lot of other observations that you might do apart from counting the number of high galaxies at high redshift so the number of high galaxies back very back in time um, and if of course you have different observations that are done with different instruments with in different ways and they all need to point in the same direction so um, one thing is that um, you need to keep in mind is that if you have a cosmological model, if you have a theory, usually it will fit more observations. So you have a number of phenomena that this theory is able to uh, explain. And these phenomena are independent. They are completely different things, but you can use the same theory to explain different things. Now, if one of these uh, observations all of a sudden, like the um, abundance of uh, massive galaxies at high redshift at some point, turns out to be at odds with the predictions of your theory, there might be other explanations. So you don't really say, uh, you don't really run to the um, conclusion that the universe is twice as old and you present it like it's a, it's a fact. There's a study that did it full stop now. We say it's 13.8 billion years for um, 25 years now, maybe, maybe more. Um, and we are wrong all the time. Now we know it's twice as old and uh, Anyway, it doesn't really work like this. So whenever you read uh, titles uh, that uh, claim have some very extraordinary claim, you should ex you should um, ask for extraordinary um, evidence. And um, as it turns out, it's not. It wasn't really the case, most likely, with the James Webb Space Telescope. But anyway, this is one of the papers that found these uh, massive galaxies and. Um, let me just show you what this paper says is that uh, they're finding so the age of mass the title is age of massive galaxies at redshift 8 redshift 8 is very high redshift means 
very uh, few years after the Big Bang, which means uh, there wasn't enough, nearly enough time for galaxies to evolve and get fat, basically, by eating other galaxies and more cosmic gas. But what they claimed in this paper, again, there, there's been more studies based, again, on the James Webb Space Telescope, is that, um, like I'm quoting them here, so these galaxies are being viewed at very high redshift with an average uh, eight point, uh, redshift of 8.2, when the Lambda CDM universe was only 600 mega years old. So it was less than one billion years old. It was only, only 600 mega years after the uh, formation of the, the, bir the birth of the universe. Um, what they say then is that given the sequence of star formation and galaxy assembly in the standard model, so these are things that we know from the standard model. So the standard model predicts how star f stars form and how galaxy assembly. So we have uh, recipes, we have a prescription of for star formation and galaxy assembly in the standard picture. So given the sequence of star formation and galaxy assembly in the standard model, these galaxies should instead be um, even younger than 290 um, uh, mega years on average, for which our analysis assigns a probability of three um, uh, times uh, 10 to the minus four. So it's a uh, 3.66 mantention. Um, again, bottom line of these numbers, <laughs> let me not dig too much into this, but the idea is that these galaxies should be older than they look and uh, it's very unlikely, so it's uh, less than three chances in 10,000 to find these objects in Lambda CDM. And now, this is a kind of tension that if you remember the numbers that I was quoting from my study, again, it was a different field, it was a different redshift, but the idea was the same. So we are talking about galaxies here, I was talking about um, um, clusters of galaxies, but uh, the idea is the same, so we, computed the probability of finding these uh, galaxies in uh, Lambda CDM, and we found out some very small number, was like 0 0.007. Um, and here is like three in 10 to the minus four, which should be some, some zero, um, point zero 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 uh, three. So it's a very small number. It's very unlikely. And if this, again, there's a big if here that, that they people sometimes forget, but if the analysis and everything has been done properly and these numbers are indeed true, then it's a problem for Lambda CDM, so it's a problem for the standard theory of structural formation to explain how such massive galaxies might have come into existence so early. Um, and this is another paper that uh, tells exactly what I was telling you and what I did basically, so it's uh, Michael boylan Colchin says made this nice paper on stress testing lambda cdm with high redshift galaxy candidates which means how do you test then the standard model of structure formation given this uh observation so we take this observation for granted now we are moving to the theory side in the sense that we are studying how we actually want to get these numbers so that that number we got before we will really want to see how at odd, uh, odds it is with the standard model of uh, cosmology and what it does here it computes the number densities uh, you see here there's this um, number density which means it's the same formula i was using actually for galaxy clusters except now it's uh, adapted for for galaxies but um, it's exactly the same kind of uh, computation that they did back then so you compute the number density of objects so how many of these objects i expect per unit volume so in, we always know that, uh, I mean, we know the universe might be infinite in size, so we need to normalize everything by volume, by the volume that we actually observe. So we need to know the density. We don't just get the number. We, ju we just, we don't need to know how many galaxies we found. We need to know how many galaxies we found within a given volume of in the universe. So what is the volume of the survey? And, what, and in this case, what is the density of uh, objects that we expect with this mass if the regular, if the standard theory of structure formation is correct. And again, what it finds is that is if this uh, survey, if these results from the James Webb Space, Space Telescope are indeed true, then the, um, there's a problem with Lambda CDM. So there's uh, the JWST, so James Webb Space Telescope Observation, 
lie at the very edge of this limit. So they are a challenge for Lambda CDM. And just like I did <laughs> 13 years ago, uh, the next thing is the, that you do is that, all right, if Lambda CDM is in trouble, then we need to look for something else. And uh, this is exactly what people have been doing. I'm just showing a few papers that I found out in the literature now, just uh, quickly taking a look. And uh, this is high redshift galaxies from uh, early JWST observations, constraints on dark energy models. Um, and this is what, exactly what I was mentioning before. Now you have a model of dark energy, which means um, a model that tells you the nature of dark energy. It's uh, in the standard model, it's, it's a constant thing. There might be dynamical dark energy models where the dark energy might be a vector, like the one I studied, or might be general dark energy, dynamical dark energy model, they're called. So, And what these authors did um, is that uh, here we show that under the most conservative assumption and independently of baryon physics involved in ga galaxy formations, such galaxy abundance is not all intentioned with the standard lambda CDM cosmology, but provides extremely high tight constraints on the expansion history of the universe and on the growth factor corresponding to a wide class of dynamical dark energy models. Now, this is, uh, again, it's pretty technical <laughs> kind of sentence, but the uh, takeaway points here is um, there's a problem with lambda CDM. We can analyze and uh, constrain models where dark energy is uh, dynamical thing. It's not a constant like in, uh, in lambda CDM. And again, dynamical dark energy models is um, a very wide class of models that might be quintessence models and vector dark energy models and, 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 and many other things that people came up uh, with during many years. But um, this is, again, this is one of the things that, that <laughs> this history repeating itself, right? We, this is what happened back then that I was doing that we are uh, looking for alternatives to Lambda CDM to explain why there are so many large objects at uh, this kind of very early um, epochs in the universe. And again, this is another kind of thing. Um, high redshift J, um, JWST observations and primordial non-Gaussianity. Uh, again, no, primordial non-Gaussianity, it's, uh, it's basically a, um, it, it's a way of uh, phrasing that has, there's no standard. Uh, the, the Lambda CDM model has assumes uh, Gaussian initial conditions. If you have non-Gaussian initial conditions in the universe, um, you are looking at uh, alternative theories. And this is what they say, such early massive galaxies seem difficult to reconcile with standard lambda called dark metal model, which is, again, it's the name of standard cosmology. And this is another avenue also that people have taken, um, studying uh, another class of uh, non-standard cosmology, so those with non primordial non-Gaussianity. So now what do we do? We are in trouble. We need to um, explain why do we see these massive objects. So we see in the paper before that was uh, claiming, um, again, that, that Redshift 8, there were um, an abundance of very massive galaxies that were not supposed to be there in the first place. And this is why people started saying um, the age of the universe might be uh, not what we thought. It might be... Uh, much uh, the universe might be much older than we previously thought because we need time to grow such massive objects um, so distant so massive um, objects and this was one of the avenues and um, of course uh, we have also seen that uh, other kinds of um, studies and other kinds of approaches have been uh, taken to uh, explain this uh, discrepancy so as I mentioned uh, before, we had uh, that the, there were attempts of explaining this by changing the nature of the standard model by um, taking into account dynamical dark energy models or kind of uh, the so-called uh, non-Gaussian uh, models um, of uh, primordial non-Gaussianity in the initial conditions. So that there, again, it's another kind of um, cosmological models where the initial conditions have a uh, statistical distribution that is not Gaussian as is uh, assumed and is also observed to a fairly large degree um, within the standard, within the, con within the context of standard cosmology. Um, but then again, this is a very uh, pretty substantial claim if we need to rewrite 
the cosmology books if you need to rethink astrophysics uh, star formation <laughs> we need to rethink the age of the universe it might be a pretty um, um, it, it's a pretty demanding claim <laughs> it's uh, requires really a lot of evidence and um, so in the last uh, there's been a, in the last couple of months actually there's been um, uh, some studies that say well maybe these galaxies were not as massive as we thought we overestimated the mass um, there might be other phenomena that we didn't account for that are completely um, understandable within standard cosmology we don't need to rewrite the standard cosmological model to explain these objects uh, after all and uh, so this is one of the articles that was uh, published already in April 2024 uh, so new data challenge early JWST claims about the age of the universe so this uh, um, this uh, group now says uh, they said well the early results from the JWST were a shock some astronomers suggested that textbooks would have to be rewritten so we decided to take a closer look and what they did in the study so now we are talking about Guillaume Despres was um, taking a more detailed look at uh, JWST data and it's coming from this uh, C-A-N-U-C-S can use UX whatever it's called <laughs> um, it's a cluster survey that's taken it's, it's looking at clusters within um, the JWST telescope and this is um, the title of their study of their paper lambda CDM not dead yet massive high Z Balmer black galaxies are less common than previously reported so the takeaway line here is <laughs> lambda CDM is not dead massive high Z Balmer break galaxies is a complicated definition for um, sort of saying that galaxies at high redshift so high Z means high redshift which means uh, again very early on uh, in the age of the universe so many many years ago um, they are less common than previously reported so this is um, why the thing is that they do a kind of analysis in which this uh, bomber break lines uh, now let me let me just summarize this it, this is a complicated thing but uh, the the whole idea is that if you look at um, at the light that's coming from these sources you find a lot of light you find that these sources are very very bright and um, this was interpreted as uh, being as there being a um, a lot of stars so if you see a lot of light you might think there's a lot of stars uh, and if there's a lot of stars then the cluster the galaxy sorry is very massive and then you should explain why there are so many stars within this galaxy so early on but there might be other explanations so they go on and they find uh, four explanations I'm not entering into the deal this is very very technical but the basic idea is that um, this uh, light was not really coming from um, clusters of stars very early on might have other uh, explanations there were biases in the observations there were um, and they uh, another thing that they did in re respect to the previous studies is that the first studies the first claims were based basically on five uh, massive galaxies now they look at 20 when they take the full sample of 20 galaxies uh, at, uh, with, w that are of the same size, the same age, so redshift, uh, high redshift, redshift eight, as you see here, it says uh, they are taking uh, almost 20, uh, so 19 sources actually at redshift eight. They are more careful within analyzing their light, so the, the how it uh, it is being emitted by the sources. And bottom line, they look, uh, they find that. Um, this is not a big deal in the end <laughs> it's a, everything can be understood so that's must there was there were two the two main issues the two main takeaway points in my opinion were that first of all they had very low statistics so if you have very few objects then even if you have some if you have some um, uh, problems with the observations of course it will be if you one of those galaxies uh, is off then it's already 20 percent of your temple sample has, has issues so it's it's a large number and you just need one object to have some kind of troubles to get 20% uh, of your whole sample um, 
sort of uh, corrupted. And uh, the other thing is that, of course, uh, when you have larger surveys, you have more objects, you might find that indeed what you, by sheer chance, you found uh, the single uh, large one, but then in the context of more volume, more objects, it's not uh, nearly as um, rare. So it's not really, it's not at odds as uh, you would expect. And this is not the only study that found uh, the thing, the, this kind of thing. So there's another interesting study that is called Evidence for Shallow Evolution in the Volume Densities of Massive Galaxies at Redshift 4 to 8 from CEERs. CEERs is the survey of, um, that it, it, this is a sample of objects taken in the, um, from the, James Webb Space Telescope and um, what this paper is doing they are again they are looking at uh, the evolution of massive galaxies at uh, high redshifts and they're doing that in two redshifts range so one to four is sort of small redshift uh, it's not very small but still it's like smaller so it's uh, more recent and then they look uh, at these large objects how many do you find um, per age so their goal was to if you take a large galaxy and you say, okay, now I want to see, uh, and, and what they take here is, ten, is um, basically galaxies that have stellar masses of 10 to the 10. So it's 10 billions of stars. So I want to look at all galaxies that have at least 10 billions of stars of the, um, of the kind of the sun. So that, that's more or less the idea. And I want to see how many of those are there at redshift one, redshift two, redshift three, redshift four, five, six, seven, eight, etc. And you should expect this number to drop down at high redshift because if you want to have a galaxy with uh, 10 billions of stars, you need time to gather these uh, these stars. And so, you in very exceptional conditions, you might find them also very early on, um, in the sense that um, if you take a very large volume, you might find one such object by sheer variance. It's called it. It's like it's a statistical um, fluctuation. Basically, you can find those. It's not completely excluded. Again, it depends on the volume. And the more you move on in time, you go, you get closer to the um, actual age, then the larger this number is. So you should expect this number to grow with time. And this is what they find. What they find is that this evolution is shallow in the sense that it does not drop down from uh, redshift four to eight. So when you go to larger, uh, to high redshift uh, it's not dropping down as fast as they thought but still it's dropping down and it's not a real um, great problem for lambda cdm in what they say here um, because what they claim is that this kind of uh, drop that they see in this uh, study um, can be explained changing by well, let, let me just quote them so this these higher abundances can be explained by modest changes to star formation physics and or the efficiencies with which star formation occurs in massive dark matter halos and are not in tension with modern cosmology so what they find is that again if you take if you do another kind of analysis and you do um, a large uh, larger survey and you put into context this for from um, so the same kind of massive galaxies at different redshifts, and you look you trace the, uh, the their um, sort of evolution. So you see how many massive galaxies are there at different epochs in the universe, which is different redshifts. Um, you don't need to change the whole picture of how galaxies evolve, of how galaxies form. You don't need to change lambda CDM. You need to change some small things which are, by the way, they are not completely understood uh, still nowadays on how star forms in the very early universe and how efficient is the star formation process. Because the thing is that um, after the Big Bang, you don't start immediately with stars. You start with the status of the universe, a state of the universe where the um, gas is uh, sort of uniformly distributed and fills the whole volume of the universe. And um, and then from these small fluctuations then you start forming stars, galaxies and um, it's again the state is, is ho almost homogeneous, there's uh, small fluctuations that grow and the more inhomogeneous the more the matter gets drawn to the uh, to the center of these um, fluctuations and the more it grows stars and uh, ends up growing stars forming stars and galaxies and, and so on. So the idea is that we don't really know how fast 
um, this gas might collapse, might be converted into stars. This, this is that, that's what it, what it's saying. Uh, there might be some changes to what we think still nowadays uh, about the uh, star formation physics and the efficiency efficiencies of star formation, of course, in dark matter halos. Dar dark matter halos is just a distribution of dark matter, which I haven't mentioned here because it was not really the point of these papers. But um, again, let me some <laughs> so wrap up and. Uh, just to with a couple of words and um the first thing is that the lesson that we learned that i learned that i, I mean i think i knew that already i should always take uh, all these new studies new claims with a grain of salt and wait for more results to come before claiming that like they did in some of the articles i was mentioning that the universe is twice as old as we thought well might be it was um it was a um possibility but then you really need to look uh, better into these uh, sources, into this, um, into the studies that they do. So, what are the assumptions? And the assumptions here that were that indeed um, these galaxies were as massive as they claim to be. But if you again, if you do the proper analysis, it need not be the case. Again, these last two papers, these last two studies that I showed, might be wrong. I mean. Um, I didn't dig that deep, I didn't look, I'm not really into the debate nowadays, but um, sometimes it happens that there's a rebuttal study and it gets shown that it's wrong. I mean, it's part of science, like showing that some studies are not correct. But um, in this case, uh, I think the bottom line is, um, for me, the, the takeaway point is in, indeed there's alternatives to uh, throwing uh, away the whole uh, picture of uh, standard cosmology. So. Again, we might just look at uh, small modifications to the way stars form, which doesn't mean lambda CDM is wrong. It means that we don't really understand how, um, or we might change some um, ideas on how efficient are the primordial um, stars in forming. So how many can we form out of uh, the gas that populates the, um, the primordial universe? And the other one is that, of course, we should never <laughs> really, almost never say, I mean, Sometimes it, it's it's pretty. Uh, there's the 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 evidence is uh, is overwhelming and it's been there for decades. But this is not the case. So when we see um, studies like this coming uh, appearing in the media and and, and get making the headlines about how we need to uh, we didn't understand anything about the universe and we need to rewrite everything and rethink everything because now the universe is twice as old as we thought. Um, we need to take these things with a grain of salt. So. <laughs> I hope I was clear enough. I haven't been talking about these subjects uh, in a while and I haven't been talking to you um, on this podcast for in a while as well. So I hope it works and I hope you manage to keep the uh, attention up to this point for which uh, I thank you for following this and next time we'll talk about something else. So thank you and see you on the next episode of the Gattocast.